Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Tech Farinas. Uh, I'm a lecturer in UCD, University College Dublin in Ireland. Um, and my presentation today is about an algorithm called multi objective feature selection in software product lines. Um, so just before starting, just wanted to explain to you what software product line. We are a laboratory that works mostly on software engineering. And in software engineering, there is a field that is uh, quite new in the area. Well, it exists a few years back, but it's quite uh, interesting in the way that we don't see software creation as writing code over and over, but we see it more as a kind of a market of tiny components. And if you want to build your software, instead of building everything, you just need to go select your products and build them together into one software. Obviously, you might want to select the right products you want, and you might be careful on kind of interoperability between them and try to fix some of them to make them work efficiently. So that's what we call software product lines. So we kind of reverse the strategy of building software by writing code into more architecture way of building the software. So when software architects try to build a software, they keep the same uh, kind of strategy as before. They try to design what is the software going to look like, what kind of uh, kind of task or tools or things they're going to use in the software. And this is what is called a feature model. So the feature model tells you what kind of tasks the software should be able to achieve. And at the same time, what kind of relationship between these tasks? Is there some kind of uh, disagreement between tasks or uh, tasks that don't go along with each other uh, or some, some kind of inconsistencies? Um, so this is just a brief example I'm giving you here. So let's imagine a case where we have a software uh, phone mobile company. Uh, you know, to, to make a mobile phone, there are plenty of components that you can choose to put into your phone. And even if you decide to, dec to put one component, there might be a different range of uh, different specifications of this component. So let's take an example of a mobile phone. I have a mobile phone. This mobile phone uh, it has to have a screen, let's say. We want to see the, who is calling and other things. It has to make calls. A mobile phone needs to make calls. You might take other decisions, but this is what our mobile company wants. Uh, there are some other features that are good to have, but not mandatory. For example, a GPS. If we consider very old mobile phones or very cheap mobile phones, they don't have GPS. Whereas if we want to go into a high-end mobile phone, we might want that. Uh, ability to have some media interactions, for example, to take camera pictures, to record videos or uh, some selfies and so on, to be able to record or even play MP3 or MP4 um, movies or uh, digital media. So you see all of these are features. Some of them are mandatory, some of them are good to have, but not that important. Good to have, but not mandatory. Uh, on the other hand, if we have, let's say, a screen, you might have a range of screens that you can use. Obviously, each of them has its advantage and disadvantage. For example, we can have a basic screen, a colored screen, a high resolution screen, an HDR screen. You see there are plenty of choices that you might want to use to achieve the same thing uh, with different uh, variations on how do you do it. Uh, and also, we might have some kind of constraints or relationships that say, oh, OK, if I want to have a GPS, then I cannot have a GPS with a basic screen. A GPS usually requires to show a map, and the map has to show with has to be with a colored screen or with a high definition screen. So you can have this kind of interoperability or exclusion relationships. On the other hand, you can also have requirements. So a camera, if you want to have a camera, then you need a higher resolution screen. You don't you cannot just have some analogic screen, some really bad screen and show the camera which has 2 megapixel, 12 megapixel, or more than that. So you see, this is a kind of example of what an architect would do for a software. Here I gave you an example with uh, a mobile phone company. This is the same thing. If you build a software, you have different tasks, and these tasks have these kind of relationships. So that's our uh, context in a nutshell. If you want to represent it, then you might represent this as a SAT problem. Uh, actually, it's quite common in the literature to represent this problem of feature selection 
as a sub problem in for software product lines. And what we do is every possible feature in every product out there in the software product line, we see it as a feature. And this feature, we put a variable f for it in binary variable called f. If it's true, it means the company chooses to use that product. If it's false, it means we don't select it, okay? And at the same time, the sad problems appears is because the relationships we make, all of them could be translated into uh, constraints in the sad problem. They are all logical constraints and they could be mapped into a sad problem. Obviously, there might you might have a scenario where it's not translatable to a sad problem. In this case, you might consider a different modeling. But in software product lines, most of the constraints that make sense to stakeholders could be represented into a sad problem. Therefore, sad problem is widely used. Alongside the constraints, you have objectives. Uh, and as you can see, in software products, you have plenty of stakeholders. You have the company itself, you have the user, you have the, uh, I don't know, the companies. Let's say if you work for a company, the company might have other objectives for there. So you see there are plenty of objectives that come along. Um, most of them that are used in literature are these five that I put here. You have correctness, that the software is correct. It doesn't have uh, issues in connecting the different tools. Uh, but we accept some granularity of errors there. If some tools don't go together, you cannot make two things work at the same time or something like that. Uh, we would like to our software to be rich. The more features, the better our software is, obviously. Uh, we don't want a feature, we would like features to be used before. A feature that is used before means uh, we detected the bugs, means that engineers are used to it, they know the technology, so there is a lot of benefit in having features uh, to select that are already used. Uh, obviously, we want to reduce the known defects. So if we select, choose to select a product, this product would like it to have less uh, arrows in it. We might accept some bugs if we judge them not very uh, high level, not very uh, drastic impact on our product, but we would like to reduce that to the list. And the last one is obviously the cost. If you would like to get a product from a different company, then we might want to pay the company for selling us this product. And that's, uh, we would like to reduce the cost of all the features we put together. So you see, there are many objectives. Many of them are antagonistic. They go against each other. If we would like to improve the richness of the software, many features, then obviously the cost goes up. So there are these aspects of antagonistic objectives between each other. And that's a multi-objective problem, uh, an exact many objective problem uh, as it is. Um, so obviously this comes with a big challenge is that many softwares now, we, call it, we talk about complex systems, we don't talk about tiny softwares anymore. There are a few small softwares, but when you go to an enterprise situation, softwares are really big. And in our case, we are working with softwares that have about 7,000 features. Um, and in terms of constraints, there are uh, the one we use has 350,000 constraints, which is quite a large impact. We cannot solve it to optimality. We can just try to get as good solutions as possible. Um, and that's the context we are uh, trying to do. So you see big problem with plenty of uh, difficulties and we try to make an, imp an optimization rather than an entirety of solving the problem itself. Um, same as what mentioned my colleague before. Um, so he mentioned that the problem is a multi-objective problem and in multi-objective problems, we don't talk about the best solution. We talk more about a set of better solutions or non-dominated solutions. In our case, if we have, let's say the cost that we would like to reduce to minimize and also the known defect that we try to minimize, then in this case, we know that some solutions are better than the other, like here C is better than F but between let's say B and C, there is no ideal between them. They are, no, none of them is non, both of them are non-dominated. And even if we consider some filtering, let's say we have some other preferences added into the problem. Let's say here we have a limit on known defect we accept or a limit on the cost we accept. There are still solutions in the area here that is non-dominated. And the best we could do is just say, these are the best solutions I find now it's up to you to make your decision which one 
to implement or which one to make in place. Um, yeah, so and another problem, uh, another challenge that comes into software engineering is that softwares are evolving quite often. Uh, obviously, the artifacts or the block of codes, they are changing. Imagine if we would like to make them better, more efficient, bugs-free, and so on. And at the same time, customers, stakeholders, they are changing their minds often. Today, I like to have the uh, list of you know, uh, users attending in Zoom in the right side. Tomorrow, I want to have it in the top. This kind of the change of customers and stakeholders' needs is quite predominant. We see a lot of change from a day to another, and we have to take that into account. Um, and at the same time, uh, what we have seen in our software, the one we are trying to work on, which is the Linux kernel, we have seen many evolutions. They evolve quite regularly. Every few months, we see a new version come in with actually a lot of changes. We have seen in the Linux kernel up to 7% differences from a version to another. And if you consider that the Linux kernel has about uh, 350,000 constraints, 7,000 of that, 7% 7 of that is quite a lot. Um, so that's a challenge that is really important to consider, which is the scale of the change of the evolution. Um, so uh, in our work, we are using the evolution of the Linux kernel. We have studied that uh, 20 successive versions of the Linux kernel, starting from version 2.6. We are talking about the kernel, not the entire Linux environment, just the kernel of the Linux uh, OS. Um, and what we start with is the version 2.6.28, which has about 7,000 features and 343,000 constraints, which is quite a lot. So what we studied it is we tried to kind of have a population of how much do uh, features change, add, remove, uh, modified inside them, the same for constraints. And we tried to create an entire synthetic benchmark just for that, which is more controlled. So we create a benchmark of several evolutions of the original Linux kernel. And what we do is we create a percentage of features that are changed and a percentage of constraints that are changed. That is why. Um, and what we do is we respect what the, the proportion that has been se that have been seen in the Linux kernel itself. And we do that in order to have a more controlled uh, evolution uh, specs. Otherwise, the Linux kernel has very changing uh, evolutions inside it, and that would make our simulations or our experiments not very trustworthy. Um, obviously, the bigger these higher these percentages of changes, the more different the version of the Linux kernel is from the original one. So if you see uh, that I'm showing a feature or a feature model that is, let's say, 10% of changes in constraints, it has more changes than one that has 1% of changes. And what we do is in our simulations, we run, we create 10 new feature models with each modification to have more robust simulation. So every result I show here is the average of over the 10 different versions of the same modification of the Linux kernel. Um, and if we look at this problem, the state of the art, um, it's actually a state of the art that dates of 2015. Um, and actually, it consists of a um, genetic algorithm, which is uh, an IBEA, indicator-based evolutionary algorithms, that is coupled with a SAT solver. So basically, the IBEA does a regular evolutionary algorithm job. Inside it, there is a correction that works using a SAT solver. So when a solution is not correct with respect to the uh, specification of the architect, a SAT solver is called in order to correct this and change things inside it to make it correct. Uh, and actually what we have seen from that is that actually when the SAT solver is called upon, the sol solutions it generates are quite far from the ones that have errors. And we were wondering, was that an error, or was that an issue or not? And actually what we did is we created our own solution, which consists of a mixed integer linear problem for just the correction. So a MILP solution just to correct the, uh, sorry. Yeah, so we created a MILP program just to see how we could correct 
these uh, errors. So if we have a solution with an error inside, let's now, instead of calling a SAT solver, we call a MILP solver with the idea of reducing the number of features we could change and to make the solution correct again. So if we have a solution that's wrong, okay, we know the constraints that are wrong. So we select the features involved and we try to change as little amongst them in order to make the solution correct again. So this is what we do here. We minimize the number of features that are changed from the solution that was wrong to make the solution correct again. And what we have seen is when uh, on the regular, so, uh, regular instances is that actually we are reducing way less with the MIP solver and we confirm that the SAT uh, correction is, might be an issue there. Um, so to evaluate our new approach, we use the same way as the present, the precedent, uh, presenter, the same, the hyper volume. So what we do is just calculate the hyper volume of the solutions found with our solution in comparison to the SAT solver. And we try to measure the hyper volume metrics. This is, a just, uh, this work for this, uh, conference is just with hyper volume. Obviously, we anticipate another work using other metrics. Uh, some of you mentioned uh, IGD, GD, Epsilon, and other uh, metrics as well. But for now, this work is just with hypervolume, and it confirms what we have seen. Um, so the first experiments we have done is um, trying to compare um, just the MILP approach against the SAT approach. So what we did is we took solutions that were correct, with the original version of the Linux kernel. And we tried to use either SAT or MILP to correct them for the new instances. So we have a bunch of instances here that are evolving from the original SAT solver. So here, an instance that changes 1% of its feature and 1% of its constraints, 5% of its features, 5% of 1% 1 of its constraints, and so on and so forth. So the first number here is the percentage of features that have changed. The second number is the percentage of constraints that have been changed from the original uh, Linux kernel. And what we see is actually, if we take just the solutions themselves without correcting them, we achieve this hyper volume. So the more distant the solution is, usually the less hyper volume we achieve because the solutions are further than the new solution, the new model itself. And now when we compare SAT uh, corrections, sorry here, and MILP corrections, we compare them over hypervolume, the time it took to do the corrections and the average mo number of modifications, okay? So in terms of hypervolume, we would like to have a large hypervolume. In terms of time of correction, we would like to have a lower time correction. In terms of number of modifications, we also would like to have a lower number of modifications. And what we see actually is on all the instances, MILP is better than SAT in doing this correctly. It achieves a better hypervolume. And actually, surprisingly, it does it also in a lower execution time. And that's actually a quite surprise because people tend to use a SAT solver because it seemed logical to use a solver that is more for logic constraints. Well, instead of a mixed integer linear problem, which is in our case, just a binary uh, integer linear problem. Uh, but actually we do this, the optimization in the lower time. And that's actually a good advantage that we actually pinpoint here in our experiments. And obviously we confirm that using the MILP solver, we would achieve a less number of modifications. You see a comparison in a range of 10% of less modifications. So here we have 141 instead of 2,600 done by a uh, SAT solver. That's actually a drastic change in the number of modifications, which kind of, uh, if you have a solution that is evolved, the SAT solver entirely ignores what the evolution achieved, whereas using the MIP solver keeps the evolution that was achieved. So now that we confirm that the MIP solver is might be an interesting alternative in the evolutionary algorithms. Now we try to inject it in with the IBA. So we compare SAT IBA in comparison to MILP IBA, where we do the correction with a MILP solver. Uh, and this is what we show here. 
on six instances. Actually, in the paper, we do it on all the instances. Here, I just select for you six instances, three of the with the least amount of modification and three with the largest amount of modification in our work. And what we see is that obviously all of them start with the same random population. Okay, we start the genetic algorithm, the IBEA with the same random population. And we do the evolution using either MILP in here in blue or SAT here in red. And we see here the hyper volume over the execution time. And what we see is that actually the, hyper, the MILP IBA directly uh, corrects the solutions towards really interesting ones. Um, without even wasting time. In the first generation, MILP IBA achieves almost Pareto optimal solutions. Obviously, it continues to improve them, but uh, it reaches almost the uh, stagnation point or the Pareto uh, plateau of the optimization straight away. Whereas SAT, uh, SAT IBA takes a bit of to the level where I'm, uh, MILP IBA is. And actually this is more appearing when the instances or the, the feature model is very distant from the original one. Um, then what we thought is that, okay, when we start with a random population, maybe MILP IBA has the advantage on SAT IBA. What's gonna happen if we start with the solutions on the original Linux kernel and we try to use MILP IBA and SAT EBA to continue the optimization, okay? So in the experiment before, we were using random population, random initial population. Here we give a seeded population. We use the solutions that were correct for the original Linux kernel, and we try to correct them for the new targeted Linux kernel, okay? Um, obviously here you see they also start at the same level because they were given the same initial population. But while MILP IBA improves it, okay, and it keeps actually continue to improve it without even showing signs that it's gonna stop, even with the time limit, it didn't converge yet. On the other hand, SAT EBA seems to be lost with the fact that we were given, giving it solutions that were correct at some point uh, for a different kernel. Uh, and actually it doesn't improve them that much. It keeps uh, jumping back and forth between better and worse uh, population here. And actually this is quite surprising. Um, we don't have a real idea why SATIBA is doing that. We plan on studying it for a uh, further publication, but actually this is uh, quite remarkable that MILPIBA corrects it and keeps improving upon it. Whereas SATIBA just is lost just by giving it an initial population with a seed what explains this uh, problem? Because they use the same IBEA. So the only difference between them is MILP and SAT uh, solvers that are used. Um, so uh, that's all in terms of experiments. Just to conclude my talk, um, what we have done is we proposed a new MILP approach to correct solutions um, for the problem of feature selection in software product lines. Um, and we have shown that our MILP approach is capable of finding solutions that are close to the initial solution that was invisible and actually in a shorter time. And when we try to combine it with a, an indicator-based evolutionary algorithm, we have seen that actually this solutions has a... And actually this is the same whether we start with a uh, a random solution or we start with a seeded approach initial population. Um, that's all for me. Uh, so if you have any question, feel free to ask it in the chat or by email. I will be available also during uh, if you want to discuss with me uh, further ideas. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this very interesting talk um, in software. Um, search-based software engineering, basically. Um, are there any questions? So there is one first comment by Sarah Thompson who says fascinating work. So I guess Thank you very much. that's a very positive feedback. Cheers. Okay, anybody wants to ask any questions? Either in writing or via the voice function. I don't mind either way. Hi, I can ask a question. 
Yeah, um, go ahead. So um, <clears throat> if you look into the albedo relaxation, uh, it may be that it's too close to the, to the result that you get from ILP. And this would justify the performance of the ILP. So you have a, a small optimality gap. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I, I agree totally with you. Um, and actually what we are doing, uh, we are preparing the work for a journal to extend this one. Uh, and we are going actually directly to the MILP IBA where we try to analyze what's the impact of the MILP solver and what's the impact of the evolutionary algorithm and what's the impact of both. So we are trying different uh, elements, different parameters and see what the impact of both, which could tell us, as you say, uh, whether it's just the correction or the uh, MILP that brings this uh, improvement or not. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, okay. Any other questions? So may maybe as a bit of a follow-up. So the, the curves for your approach look quite interesting that you basically saw all the, I think it was slide 13, all the improvement right at the beginning and then hardly anything happened. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any idea why this is the case that basically this first step already does most of the work? Um, actually, what we have seen is that um, many of the solutions that are found by the IBA are mostly invisible, okay? And that's actually one of the reasons why SAT has been proposed as a mm -hmm. correction method. Uh, and the problem is when SAT is involved, as you have seen, it makes a lot of changes. We have seen 2000 features that have been changed. When you have 7,000 features, that's almost, I don't know, a third or one quarter, right? That's a lot okay. of changes, which means whatever the IBA is doing, SAT is just focusing on finding good solution, feasible solutions while missing all the other aspects. And what the MILP solver is doing is just, it keeps the advantage of the IBEA, which is what evolutionary are doing. They are doing good improvement, but when they do their crossover or mutation, they mostly lead towards infeasible solution. And that's what MILP IBA is doing, just fixing the uh, advantage. And actually what we have seen is that actually IBA does a good work just in the first approach by mixing solutions, okay? It's, okay. It covers a large space. And actually here it's five objectives. So it's not multi-objective, it's mostly many objectives. Mm -hmm. So covering the research space is really important. And what SATIBA is missing is that it either solves or, or optimize the four objectives or one objective, which is the correctness. So it doesn't get the kind of uh, uh, trade-off between the four and the one that is correctness. That's the feeling we get now from the new results we get. Okay, very interesting. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, this, just double check, this does not seem to be the case. Okay, so as you said, you're available for follow-up questions afterwards. Definitely, yeah. Okay, so thanks again for your talk. Just some virtual applause and we'll move on to the next talk then. Thank you. Yes, thanks.